The Humanities Council of Washington, D.C. is proud to present Freedoms, Rights, and Responsibilities, a series of programs supported by the National Endowment for the Humanities' We the People initiative, dedicated to exploring significant themes and events in U.S. history and sharing the lessons with all Americans. Welcome to Humanities Profile. My name is Ethelbert Miller, and my guest today is Annie Shala. Annie Shala is an Iraqi-American businessman, artist, and activist. Recently, he opened the very popular Busboys and Poets, a wonderful place for food, networking, poetry, and political discussions. Andy, welcome. Thank you very much. I want to take you back to about maybe 1966, take you back to your childhood. Mm. Do you remember the moment when your parents informed you that you were coming to America? I do, actually. Um, coming to America was the coveted spot to come to. Everyone, when they heard they they were going to be traveling, to say you're coming to America was that you reached the ultimate goal of your life dreams. And um, it was a very exciting time. I remember just running all over the house screaming, yeah, yeah, we're going, we're going to America. So you knew for a little time that, that this was going to happen? Or? Actually, it was sort of by surprise. My, my, my father had been had been retired because the Ba'ath regime had just taken over and he wasn't involved with them in any way. So he was doing some traveling and went to Egypt. Um, and in Egypt, he met with, with Nasser, um, the then president of Egypt, who happened to be talking to him and says, you know, we have an opening for, for someone to represent uh, the Arab League in the United States. Do you think you might be interested? And he says, would I? So he, he went ahead and took the job. Well, if I look at the age that you are, mm -hmm. are you leaving friends behind? You mean back then? Yeah, back then. Well, yeah, of course. I mean, I think that was the, uh, the part we didn't think about till we got here. Suddenly you feel so foreign and so different, and mm -hmm. um, suddenly you feel alienated, and you start missing everybody back home, you know. I remember coming here, and it took about maybe three to four months before you start feeling homesick. Mm -hmm. And the homesickness is very, very um, upsetting. I mean, you, you start crying and longing for your friends and you know you go through a period of withdrawal. Mm. As many years have passed but if you look back are there any memories that you still cherish? In Iraq? Yeah. Oh yeah I, I, I remember some some wonderful memories I mean um, the summers in Iraq very very hot you know it could be 120 130 degrees sometimes in the sun and uh, we used to have a wonderful backyard uh, where we lived that had a lot of fruit trees and plum trees and, and apricot trees and date trees. And I remember going out in the backyard during a very hot summer day, for example, and watering all the plants and the trees and then sitting in the branches between the branches of the trees and picking plums. And I could still remember the warm juice of the of the plums, you know, oozing down yeah. my arms. It's just it's just, it's a yeah, wonderful memories. Yeah. We used to have chickens in our backyard. We used to raise our own chickens. And uh, my job was to go collect the eggs every morning. So that was, that was kind of now exciting. How did you get that job? Well, you know, I, I always loved animals. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I was just, just enjoyed uh, animals all the time. So you didn't see it as a chore? No, no. It was actually, I looked forward to it. And I liked sort of revving them up in the morning, pissing them <laughs> off, <laughs> pissing off the chickens. Right, right. Yeah. Right. I still think the Woody Allen, we need the eggs. We need, right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Andy, I know that many times when um, people do come to the United States, uh, there are many changes. Okay, mm -hmm. I'm sitting here calling you uh, Andy, yeah. but your actual name is Anas, right. and, and, and I, I look up as that, um, I'm assuming your name after Anas Ibn Malik, uh -huh. uh, who was the, one of the early followers of Islam and right. actually gave up the Hadith. Yeah. Uh, is that uh, something that was uh, occurred after you were here for a while? Well, it's, it's really funny that you say that. My name is, it's, it's, it's A-N-A-S, pronounced Anas, mm -hmm. and it's very difficult for Americans, it's, especially then, they weren't used to as many foreigners around. Now we have all kinds of unusual names. In fact, all of my children's friends, you know, none of them are anglicized in any way. You know, they all sound so different. Mm -hmm. So it's easy for, for people to get used to those sounds. But back then, it was this very, very unusual. So every time I had to go say my name, I had to say it four or five times, and then it's always mispronounced. Uh, you know, so it's, it's very, you know, it's, as, a, as a kid, you just didn't want to have your name mispronounced right. all the time. So I remember one day, you know, my father, uh, after he left uh, the government, after he left uh, being the representative for the Arab League, he decided to open a restaurant 
totally different. You know, <laughs> this is a whole story by itself. But he decided to open a restaurant, and um, we worked in it. And it happened to be an Italian restaurant. So we had to pass for Italians <laughs> in order to make it authentic. Right. So I became Andy and my brother became Tony. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We won't go any further. We, we, don't, know, we, don't, know, we don't want to know where the bodies are buried. Uh, <laughs> if we had a third brother, we would have been Guido, but we, we stopped at Andy and Tony. <laughs> but, you know, we joke about that, but we do see, for example, you know, you, you sort of take on, you know, another culture. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Was there any attempt in terms of within the house to hold on to certain things? Well, you know, my parents were really not that, that big on that. I mean, they really want us to sort of blend and want us to fit in and want us to get all the opportunities that, that everybody else has here in this country. So they didn't really kind of, you know, say we must hold on to traditions. You know, it wasn't like that. Although, you know, as time went by, they started realizing how important it is to hold on to traditions. And, and in fact, I have a sister that was born here in this country who, um, She's 14 years younger than I am, uh, and she speaks, reads, and writes Arabic fluently. So uh, that's kind of unusual for someone to be, to be you know, born here and be able to hold on to those traditions. Uh, so my parents are very strict with my sisters also. That was the other thing about the tradition, hanging on to that. My, Let me ask my you sisters about were, were right. not allowed to date, right. Right. for example. Right. Let me ask you about your, your mother first. Uh -huh. um, many times in, in households, um, Say a man gets a new job and they, they call it for relocation. Uh, the woman has to pick themselves up yeah. and make that transition also. Was coming to the United States difficult for your mother in terms of leaving friends, the community? Yeah, I mean, my mother was, she was a professional. She was a, she was a school principal and was a uh, deputy superintendent in Baghdad. So she was very involved in, uh, in education and was an, uh, a very educated woman. And she, so she had her own career, uh, and she had to leave that, of course, uh, to be able to come here and move with my father. Um, and was it easy for her to pick up a career when she was here? Well, she never picked up a career here. She ended up uh, uh, just retiring, really, and not, and not working uh, again uh, since she came to this country. Uh, you know, this country was very difficult for my mother, I think. You know, she, In what way? Well, she still doesn't speak English that well, you know, having been here almost 40 years. Um, she, she just... She, she, she just got her driver's license about eight, nine years ago. So this She's was... doing better than me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that was kind of unusual for her. Um, you know, so I mean, you know, I think there was a lot of adjustments that they had to make. They had to find new communities, new people to associate and, and uh, interact with. And they never really quite adjusted to the American culture. Did you feel this growing up? We're here, you, 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 even though you said earlier you were very excited about coming here, did you feel any sort of things perhaps within your house changing? Perhaps, you know, your mother giving up a career. Was there a certain sort of stress that occurred in the house? In terms of oh, there, there was a lot of stress. There was, you know, the stress that happened after my father had to leave his government job. Uh, you know, having been represented for the Arab League, you know, the 1967 Arab-Israeli War broke out. Mm -hmm. And, of course, relations with the, uh, between Arab countries and the United States were broken. And so, uh, you know, after that, he had to find an alternative career. And I remember, you know, uh, he, he had a Ph.D. in, in uh, Arabic literature. So not much he could do with a Ph.D. in Arabic literature back in 1968, 69. So he, he thought about, what am I going to do? You know, he applied to different universities to see if he can you know, be a professor. And he was accepted at Utah State University to teach Arabic at the university level there. And we were packed, ready to go. And two days before we were, we were ready to leave, or like, maybe like a week before we were, uh, we were getting ready to leave, a friend of hers, a friend of my father's, who was Iraqi, came to him and said, you're really not going to go work for somebody, are you? This is America. It's a land of opportunity. You create your own jobs. You have to find a business. Do some business. He says, I have this friend of mine who's selling a restaurant. He says, why don't you get into the restaurant business? It's a great business. And my father says, what are you talking about? I know nothing about restaurants. <laughs> and he says, well, you don't have to do, you know, there's not much you can do, you know, you, you need to know, you know, just, so just, suddenly just do Salt Lake just City wasn't looking exactly. that attractive yeah, anymore. Yeah, right. <laughs> so he took my father, I remember my father took us and took uh, uh, it, was, it was my father and my brother and myself. We went to this would-be restaurant that he was going to buy, and we sat at the counter, uh, you know, to watch. It was a Friday night, and the register didn't stop ringing all night long. And my father says, "Uh huh, that's what I want to do." <laughs> so, so he ended up, you know, just 
shelving the idea of going to Utah mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and, and decided to buy this restaurant. Mm -hmm. and, I want to talk about your father yeah. a second in terms of um, him being involved with the athlete at a key time. And around your dinner table were the political issues discussed? Did you talk a lot of politics in your household? Yeah, I mean, the Arab-Israeli conflict was obviously at the forefront then because it was very shortly after we got here that the Arab-Israeli uh, the Six Day War happened. Um, and so, yeah, that was a constant discussion. And, you know, I, I still remember the crackling Were there any values that, you're, that was being passed down from your father to, your, you, know, to you and your, and your, and your um, brothers in terms um, of, you know, beliefs? Well, um, the Israelis stole Arab land. And we must get it back. <laughs> that was, <laughs> it was that simple. <laughs> it was that simple, you know. And uh, so that, there was a, there was always this this sense of of uh, you know there's there's something that's that, that's going to happen to to avenge the Arab cause somehow, you know, that the Arabs and Palestinians were wronged in 1948, and how is it that you know the world doesn't see this, and how can we you know as an Arab nation come together and be able to you know, give them back the rightful land. And so, you know, when Nasser declared um, the idea of war against Israel, there was a, you know, a lot of jubilation among the Arab, the Arab masses. And so there was a real interest in seeing where is this is going to lead to. And, and suddenly mm -hmm. the defeat came and, you know, no one wanted to believe it for a long time. And I remember, you know, my father searching his little shortwave radio, trying to find the right radio station that's going to give him something positive about what's going on mm -hmm. and, you know, Switching station to station to station, till I think he was down to one at the end of this that was giving him good news. Well, let's look at this. You, you turn away at this particular time from the politics of the Middle East. Uh -huh. You're here in, in the United States, yeah. and that's also a time in terms of uh, racial riots. Yeah. How did you react to those conditions? It was very confusing. You know, it was like a almost a year after we were here, the assassination of Martin Luther King took place, and. And, you know, I remember we were living in Arlington at the time and going on top of the roof of our building and seeing smoldering buildings uh, out of D.C., you know. It was a very surprising, shocking kind of occurrence, you know. It just never really made quite sense to me. Well, let's try to make some sense yeah. out of it. Uh, here it is, you're, you know, your new immigrants coming yeah. in. It's, America represents certain things. Perhaps someone looks at the riots in terms of things, people burning things down. Who are, who are you angry against? Who do you side with? Well, it's, it's very interesting. When we first came here to the United States, there was no, uh, you were either black or white. So we were categorized in the black category because we weren't white. Mm -hmm. And so there was this, this, uh, this feeling is how do you fit into a, a culture you're not familiar with? And so for, for years, you know, I was black, uh, you know, being in... You in still are, Andy. Yeah, of course, yeah. <laughs> I've, I've gone through many phases. I'm back in my black phase, finding my roots again. There's no more stages. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you go through these sort of phases, you know. And so it was, it was a very, in, you know, an interesting time to really try to understand the racial dynamics of this country. Um, I remember traveling down to Florida one year. Uh, we were coming from, we were here in Northern Virginia, we're driving down to Florida and we stopped at a, at a restaurant in Georgia. And I remember going in and, and, and find this hush to the whole restaurant. There's these different looking people walking through the door. And, um, you know, I, I didn't know what to make of it. You know, sort of these little moments that you kind of remember. file away and you remember. Right. Um, but there was always a sense of, of uh, I, was, I was black in the summer, for sure. <laughs> and as, as, as the winter came around, I, I got a little whiter, but, mm. but, but, but uh, still identified in the black category mm. within the school. Within well, the let's, school let's look at two key points. Mm -hmm. um, you attended Catholic University for a yeah. and also Howard University. Yeah, yeah. I mean, those are two unique these communities. Yeah. What was that experience like? Um, you know, the university experience was a great experience because it sort of opened up the doors to so many other Let's talk ways. About and you start first. seeing, yeah, you start seeing different people. There's a lot of big, huge Arab community that was there. Uh, there was a big, uh, a big Iranian community that was there. Lots of different communities you were able to fit in. And so we were very much involved in the international club. And so we sort of embraced our internationalism, I think, once we, and when I say we, it's my brother and I. Mm -hmm. we're, we're about two years apart. Um, we, we embraced our internationalism uh, once we, went, we, we got into the university. Was, now, at Catholic University, you became interested in theater and the arts. Uh -huh. uh, what did that mean in terms of enriching your life? Uh, well, the arts have always been very important to me. I mean, I, I have been, um, I remember as a kid, um, 
you know, did my first painting, and it was a, a, a painting of a, of a of a landscape of like mountains and a and a duck pond or something in front. And I remember the, uh, taking that to school and giving it to my teacher as a, like a present for mm -hmm. some for something. And the teacher was in awe mm. at how good it was. And I remember her stopping the whole class and saying, "Look at this! Look at how good this is!" And that stuck in my mind. I said, mm. "That's where my talent lies. Right. I should I should pursue it further." <laughs> yeah. But you actually pursued the test tubes and, and you moved into like microbiology. I, I did. I did. You know, my my parents said, "You have to be a doctor. You have to be a doctor." Well. I get sick of the sight of blood. I, I, it, it never really occurred to me that I really wanted to be a doctor. In fact, they wanted me to be a doctor so bad that I, I applied to Howard University, got accepted in, in the medical school there, went to medical school for money and dropped out. <laughs> <laughs> this is not for me. Right, right. So I, but I got into the research end of it, mm -hmm. uh, and I did research at the uh, NIH. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was, I was doing leukemia research for a while. When you say that, you know, you look at that skill that you picked up, mm -hmm. and then you look at the 1980s. Mm -hmm. You know, where you look at leukemia, you look at AIDS developing. Mm -hmm. Do you see yourself sometimes looking back saying, you know, if I had pursued this, I would have obtained a skill in which I would be able to help people in this way, in terms of my research affecting people? Well, when I, first when I first went into it, I did walk into it with that kind of an eye, you know, sort of this naive eye that research is pure and is wonderful and so, mm -hmm. you know, you're going you're gonna to save the world, discover mm -hmm. something important. And then once I got in there, I, I realized it's the most political field in the entire world. I mean, you, you walk in there and you're immersed in politics. It's all about who's going to have what data and where the money's going to come from and all that. So it became a very competitive, backstabbing, you know, very ugly mm -hmm. field. I, I didn't like it. Mm -hmm. I didn't like it right from the get-go. And so I knew that I had to get out somehow. Mm -hmm. So you got out, and, and, and this moves you. I'm going to jump into uh -huh. your involvement in terms of being a businessman. Mm -hmm. And um, I want to ask you some general questions about business. And that, and sure. that is, uh, why does a person open a restaurant or a cafe? I mean, do you have some sort of philosophy behind the type of place you want to create? Um, I mean, I started to understand the power of food a long time ago, you know, started to realize that food is... Wait, wait, let me go back. I mean, power food, that sounds like your mother telling you you can't get up from the table until you feed the <laughs> <laughs> What does that mean, the power of food? Well, the, the, the way that food can bring people together. Mm -hmm. uh, I, mean, I mean, really, that was, you know, you sit at the dining room table when you're having a conversation, when you meet somebody, meet them for coffee. It's sort of like ritual. It's a ritual that, that every culture in the world has. Uh, and it's a, a ritual that also binds cultures uh, in so many ways. And so, you know, there was... I've always enjoyed being around people, uh, and I wanted a, a, the type of business that will attract people to what I'm doing, mm -hmm. and therefore sort of, uh, um, you know, capture them in a, in a, in a mm -hmm. sense. Um, and food was really was was the the way that I knew how to how to do it. Now, did you see yourself also drawing upon like you know your 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 cultural roots? Oh, absolutely. I think I think you know there's a lot of you know food. Uh, plays a very important role in, in the Middle East. I mean, uh, everything is centered around food. What's key if we... If we if My we, father judges a party by the food. And what does he look for? Uh, the quality, mm -hmm. how everything is presented, how good everything tasted. I mean, you can have the, the, the best ambiance, everything could be perfect, mm -hmm. you could have beautiful music, you could have wonderful program. If the food isn't up to par, the party sucks. Mm -hmm. It's over. So for my father, food is very important. Okay. Yeah. You opening of a restaurant. How do you find a good cook, the cook, the best chef? How, how do you go about hiring that person? Well, I have a good sense for food, so I, I sort of start out with the ideas of what I want, what I what I think uh, most people like. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a pretty good cook myself, so I I have certain standards that I like to to achieve, and I try to find people that will meet those standards and and work with me to to develop a menu that. Uh, is not ego-driven, but a menu that's really driven by the guest. Uh, that's how I, 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 I see food. Um, okay. Let's look at your first skewers, right? Yeah, skewers. Uh -huh. Let's, how does that develop? Where do you get your name from? Why are you using like maybe Lebanese food here? <laughs> um, also, um, how difficult was it to open that first restaurant? Um, the first restaurant was, was very difficult. I mean, it, it was new, first of all. I, I didn't know what, what to expect. And, you know, it's very interesting, but when you start opening a restaurant, if you're a creative type person, 
a lot of stuff happens inside your mind. You're, you know, you're, you're, you're thinking about how it's going to look. You envision the opening night. Mm -hmm. You envision people sitting and ooing and aahing over the food. You envision the type of client that's going to eat there. You envision all these things. Mm -hmm. And the more you envision all that, the more you isolate yourself from reality, you know, in, in a sense. So you sort of establish your own sense of what is to be expected once the door opens. How did you find the location? Well, uh, my brother, uh, who, was, uh, who also has worked as a, as a developer, uh, he's, a, he's an engineer and he does some, you know, some light development stuff. So he was looking around and, and found the space. It was a, a building that was just renovated um, and um, the owners wanted to, to, to lease it to a restaurant. And um, he, he struck a deal with them and he started the construction. So he did the construction phase of it and then I started doing the, the other stuff. The, Let's bring another person in. Uh, what is your wife saying about all this right now? <laughs> <laughs> you decide you want to open a restaurant. Um, well, um, we were just married at the time. So, uh, was that in the vows? <laughs> that wasn't the vows. She, <laughs> she knew I needed to get a job. <laughs> so it was, a, it, was, it, was, it was a job, you know, something to do. Um, and, I, you know, I think you know, she has a lot of faith in me. She's, uh, she's been great in that sense, you know, sort of leaving me uh, to How do my thing. How can you name thing. the restaurant after her? <laughs> <laughs> That's what they do in the movie. Right? That's what they do in the movie. <laughs> Those are the movies. <laughs> Those this the is movie. real life. <laughs> so we ended up, um, you know, having this, uh, this restaurant with food that I felt the most familiar with, which was Middle Eastern food, because uh, I wanted to be, you know, familiar with all aspects of the restaurant. So... And having sort of grew up in a restaurant, because after my father took over the restaurant business, we were there almost every single day. We'd come after school, go to the restaurant, mm -hmm. do our homework, start working, come home, do the same thing. Who oh. was your competition, Mama Isha? Who, who's, who's your competition? Here? Yeah. Uh, and, uh, I guess Mama Isha was, yeah. was, was probably at that time uh, the one that's probably the best known mm -hmm. of the Middle Eastern uh, genre. And Middle Eastern restaurants weren't that many at that time. We were fairly new. Um, Middle Eastern food was becoming kind of hip, you know. People started to know what hummus was. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, I think that, was, that was something that we wanted to capitalize on and take advantage of. Many times when people look at the business, um, they talk about the, the pros and cons of developing a business using the family model. Mm -hmm. You're talking about your brother. Was, was there different views? Was, was he the best partner for you? Well, and, and, I mean, we, we later sort of learned we have such different styles. We weren't really the best partners mm -hmm. uh, with, with uh, one another. And so we split up the business. But, but the, the most difficult part about opening the first restaurant is really the rude awakening that you get. Once you open the door, you realize that all these images you had inside your head weren't real. I mean, you know, there wasn't this huge outpouring of people walking through the door. It wasn't as easy as you thought it was going to be, you know, it was much harder than he expected it to be and so on. So there was a lot of disappointment, really. And, uh, you know, most people, you know, know me as a very successful business person who's had a lot of uh, successful restaurants, but Skewers, when I first opened it, was not successful. Mm -hmm. it, was, it, was, it was really, uh, I remember having many nights where we had like several, a handful of people walking through the door. If, if you look at the mistake that you made, what would have been one of the, you would have done differently? Um, I would have been probably done more of my homework uh, by sort of connecting with the environment I was in. I was very inside my head and, and really didn't have the opportunity to go out much and meet the people and meet the neighbors and meet the other business people around. And so I, I you know, for, for, for a while I would, uh, you know, we would sit at the, at the front waiting for the customers to walk in and, you know, our customers don't just walk in, you know. Uh, a lot of times when you see successful restaurants you say, oh, they're so lucky, you know, the people just, just fell through the door. Mm -hmm. You know, luck has very little to do with it. It's a lot of hard work to get those people right. through the door. Let's look, uh, sort of come up to where we are today. Yeah. Um, our city's changing, you know. It's changing yeah. in terms of color, gentrification, everything's changing. Right. Um, you put a business where you have now on, like, say, 14th Street, uh, kind of meaning going up across the street. What are the risks in terms of this changing city? It looks like it could be good for businesses, it could be bad for businesses. Yeah, I mean, you know, if you're looking just strictly from a business perspective, you know, I think more development is always better. You know, you get more people, you get more people have more money, of course you're going to get more, uh, more, more, more business. But I think if you're looking at a sense of, um, you know, being a part of a community, developing a, being uh, an instrument in, in, in creating that community, then you look at other things as well. You know, to me, I really never opened a business to make money, honestly. There's never, 
it's always been either uh, a love or something that I want to do. It's just a, an extension of my creativity. Um, you know, a painter does not paint a painting to sell it. I mean, usually the best painters don't do that. Let me put you on the spot here. Yeah. Um, you're across the street now in terms of busboys and poets from the Reeves Building. Um, I don't know what goes on in the Reeves Building. I don't want to know sometimes. But if you were looking at the things that are needed for Washington, D.C. in terms of, of you were the new mayor, for example, mm -hmm. what would be some of the concerns that you would be focusing on? Um, there's a lot of concerns, I think, that, that the city has to be involved in. Um, you know, interesting, this whole thing of gentrification has been at the forefront of my mind and, you know, had a lot of conversations about it and um, trying to do something about it as well. There's, there's a moment in gentrification where things seem to work well, you know. Such as? Uh, well, for, for, for example, you know, take the 14th Street, uh, the 14th Street Corridor. After the riots and, and uh, you know the a time there was a real it was a real depressed corridor. I mean there was heroin addicts and drug addicts and crack addicts all over the street there by U Street. Mm -hmm. um, it wasn't safe to be in at any time of day or night for that matter. And uh, all of a sudden you have this new development coming. You have new restaurants. People walking the streets suddenly, and and suddenly there's this moment in time where you see this sort of mixing of cultures coming together. Mm -hmm. It becomes a crossroads. It becomes a real opportunity for the city to grow and, and mature. And yet, you know, and so that's, that's one, the first phase of gentrification. And then you get the second phase where it just tips. And suddenly, it just, you push everybody out that was there, and you get this new slew of people that are there that are not really connected to the space they're in. And suddenly, gentrification rears its ugly head. And so everyone talks, that's the part that's bad about gentrification. The first part of gentrification, most people would agree, is probably not a bad thing because you're, you're creating a safer environment, more services, and so on. So the city or the government you know, needs to get involved and put some kind of blocks to slow down the tipping point mm -hmm. and allow for, for somehow the good part of gentrification to continue to, to move forward and the ugly part to get held back. Well, one of the good parts of the area that you're discussing is your restaurant, Bus Boys and Poet. Talk about the beginning of this, because it's a partnership that's there, um, the location, mm -hmm. um, the name. Um, fill us in in terms of why you decided to build something like Bus Boys and Poet. Well, I, I, again, I think the neighborhood sort of dictated it. You know, I, I um, uh, you know, having learned with my mistakes and, and, and successes throughout the years, I, I realized the most important thing in building a, a business is really building a community uh, because those are the people that are going to come and take care of you when, when, when things get tough. And, and I'll give you a perfect example. This is a little bit of a segue, but when 9-11 happened, uh, the attacks of 9-11 here, a lot of restaurants went under. Uh, it, was, it was a very difficult time for restaurants. Tourism was way down so on. We, um, myself and my business, flourished. Uh, Luna Grill and Mimi's, my other restaurant, did immensely well. We did immensely well after 9-11 because we became community centers. Mm -hmm. People used to come out and eat because they wanted to talk to other people. So we didn't depend on the passerby who just happened to be in the city for a day and happens to stumble over you, but really people that are invested in what you're doing and they want to be a part of it and they want to support you. Mm -hmm. So yeah, the, the, that lesson is, is, is learned. I, I, I learned it over time as being being a part of the of the community and investing yourself in the community and giving well, to the community. Well, you also made a decision to use industrial bank. Yeah, Could absolutely. Talk about that? Absolutely. I mean, it was just the natural thing to do. You know, you, here here you are. You're you're moving in a, in an area that's predominantly black. Um, you know, the idea is you want to give. You want to continue and 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 sort of foster and develop that that sense of community within that community itself. And so in the, the industrial bank, being one of the oldest black-owned banks in the country, was the natural place for me to go to try to get money, to keep the money and the resources in the community. Um, so they were wonderful, and the, I had the opportunity to, to make a, a very good deal with them. And, now, and what, they understood what I was doing, so they were very supportive. Let's talk about your relationship with Teaching for Change. Which is I was on the board of Teaching for Change, which is uh, an organization that brings uh, uh, all kinds of civics type education to city schools here in Washington. And um, um, I, I had worked with them in the past. I know they had this wonderful catalog they put out, all these wonderful books every year. 
and I thought it'd be a great opportunity for them to be able to find to have a storefront. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it will get their name out to the community that they're trying to serve, and also uh, be able to help me put together a bookstore that I wanted to have. Um, bookstores are very hard to run and very hard to make profitable. Mm -hmm. And so I approached them and see if they were interested in it, and sure enough, they were. Um, so they run the bookstore as a nonprofit, and it's one of the few bookstores in this in the city of this size that makes money. And the reason why it makes money is because they don't have to pay rent, they don't have to pay for the electricity, they don't have to pay for the phone, they just are there to just manage and be able to keep up with the inventory. Mm -hmm. So it's been a great relationship. For me, it's a great spot because it adds a, a, a lot of ambiance. It creates a, 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 a wonderful place for people to gather. A what, were, what were some of the names of this place? Uh, I, I sort of remember well, some names being mentioned. Yeah, well, we had we had thought. I mean, the the first thing that that came up, you know, is I wanted to make sure that everyone is involved in the whole process of developing this restaurant was the name Busboys and Poets, which is named after the poet Langston Hughes, who worked as a busboy here in Washington in the 1920s. And so, using the word Busboys and Poets, I remember sending it out to a few people, say, "What do you think of the name?" And I received a couple of emails back saying. I don't think this is an appropriate name because you know who wants to be called a boy. <laughs> this is this is you know we're here. I think I said we're in the 21st too. century. You don't call <laughs> men boys. You know what is this bus boys? You know you can't do that. You know so I thought you know bus men, um, busers, busers. <laughs> busers. You know and it, and, and yeah. none of it made sense. Yeah. It seems so shallow and so fake. You know when you start you know meddling around with that kind of stuff. And so, you know, we went back and forth and back and forth. And I think you were involved in that I conversation. Sure <laughs> uh, yeah, about the idea of, of, of how, do you, how do you hold true to the name sure. as it was? Because Langston Hughes was called the bus boy poet. Mm -hmm. You know, he wasn't called the bus man poet. Right. You know, he worked as a bus boy, you know. So how do you hold true to that and, and yet not offend other people? And so, you know, we, we sort of decided that... Well, let's, let's, talk, stick, let's talk about holding true to certain things. Um, if I was um, a very conservative guy, uh, I would walk in maybe to Busboys and, and, and look at a few book titles before I even looked at the menu and, and perhaps maybe go out. I mean, um, how do you create a space that you feel is very welcoming to people? I mean, in and, and terms at the same time, have a space that does have its particular politics. Well, I mean, again, it's understanding your community. I mean, I wouldn't open a place like this and, you know, and, and some sort of conservative town, USA, you know? It, it, this is a, Washington DC is a unique, special town and it, it has, a, you know, its own sense of community. And I think this, this restaurant, the store, really speaks true to that sense of community that Washington has. Um, it works very well for, for and, and it happens to fit my politics. I wouldn't open a, a, a place in a conservative area. Uh, it wouldn't fit my own personal politics. Talking about your personal politics, yeah. uh, if a person walks into Busboys and they go to your Langston room, they see your, your mural, mm -hmm. your Peace and Justice mural. Mm -hmm. um, was that an idea that was in your head before the, the restaurant? Yeah, I mean, I, uh, I've had those images uh, hanging in my, I, I, had, I had a home office uh, when, uh, you know, before we opened Busboys of Poets and it had these big images. I had them all over the wall and I made them into, into wallpaper. And, uh, so but they're not just images. I mean, if you if you look at it, uh, there is a sense of, of struggle. There yeah. is a sense of individuals. Uh, I'm going to put you on the spot. Why do some people have frames around their heads and others don't? <laughs> <laughs> That's purely aesthetic. <laughs> what am I doing? Up <laughs> that has nothing wall? to do with. It. <laughs> <laughs> you I have a frame thing? around your head. I remember that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that that's purely just this from an aesthetic balancing uh, point of view. That's, My head, that's, right? That's artistic. Yeah. Your head was just off off. <laughs> Off kilter, and I had to balance it with a frame. Well, let me tell you. I, I'll tell you how. And I have to put a frame around your head; otherwise, it's just too big. Right, but I, 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 I tell you this in terms of, uh, of things that I, I, I do. I'm very excited about. It does speak to me. You know, I won't say it just because I'm in there, but it does. If I was a younger person, it does tell me. Okay, I have a certain responsibility. If I look at a picture of a gun, you're king. I, and and I wonder about that in terms of one. Should one look at the mural and then like go to the bookstore and buy something? I mean, is that how you want the place well, to work? Well, I mean, I I like them to look at the mirror uh, at the at the mural of, and feel hopeful. I mean, I, I think oftentimes in these in these very difficult times, uh, you know, these uh, warring times, political times, and so on, 
people tend to be in a lot of despair. They, they tend to lose hope. And I think looking at the mural, you realize, you know, there were people that had walked on this earth that, that made some amazing, amazing strides against the biggest of odds. And it gives us, I think, for, especially for young people, when they see it, they feel like, yeah, it's possible. I, I, can, I can see myself doing this. I can see myself walking in the, in the footsteps of these of this giants that we have on the wall. And it's not just giants we have there. We have ordinary people, too, there. And that's important, I think, for people to understand. It's about people it's, make history. Exactly. It's, it's not just about the icons. The icons don't, aren't the ones that make the history, really. It's the people that make the history. And now, you're talking about people. You've had, since the restaurant is open, uh, you've had a number of people come through and speak mm -hmm. uh, at Busboys, um, do author signing. Looking back over a year, who are some of the people that have a special place in your heart, people that you really admire that mm. have been in the space? Well, I mean, one of my favorites always stands out is, is, uh, is Howard Zinn, uh, who is a, is a historian and has written People's History of the United States and has been such a wonderful friend and ally. Uh, he, was, he was amazing. I remember, you know, when we first uh, had, him, had him booked to come and speak, I thought, well, you know, how many people can come, you know, I, I want to make sure that we let people know because I don't want to be embarrassed when not many people show up for an event and so on. So I was kind of a little concerned about it and suddenly like five hours before the event was going to start, there was a line forming outside the door and I thought, oh my God, this is amazing. Mm -hmm. And uh, all of a sudden you see, um, you know, hundreds of people walking, you know, walking in and, and, and fighting to get in to hear Howard Zinn. Mm -hmm was a real um, eye-opening experience for me, thinking, hey, you know, there are a lot of people that care about the same issues that I care about, that care about justice in the world, that care about the good, and so on. So it's been, it, was, it was just a, a very exciting Sanchez. moment for me to see that. People like Sonia Sanchez, uh, you know, coming in, just uh, being there and just standing up and, and, and having come to open, open mic night, right. you mm -hmm. know, or, or, or people like, um, like, uh, like Amiri Baraka, uh, who happened to be just uh, sort of dropping in, was looking at the mural, and he looks at, at the picture and says, that picture was taken in my house. <laughs> he says, that was a spirit house in New Jersey. I remember I was there. You know, I took the picture. You know, it's like these, these, these kind of moments that you get that like you say, wow. Um, there, there's been you know, so many just and, and ordinary people. Um, there's a, uh, um, there's a, a a gentleman by the name of Anthony Age, who's uh, in his 80s, uh, he's a local guy and a, and a wonderful, gifted poet, who mm -hmm. um, who was walking uh, walking around one day and just happened to drop in open mic night, and was coming in very regularly to open mic, and we sort of had this special seat for him when he walks in. You know, he's an elderly guy, and we had to had him sitting down, made sure he had a chair every time, and uh, I remember ro sort of running into him one day, um, a couple of days after an open mic night, and um, I invited him in to come and have a cup of coffee with me, and we were inside talking, and he says, you know, I lived here for most of my life, and he said, I was getting ready to move to Baltimore. And I, then I walked by here and went into Busboys and Poets and got involved in this open mic thing, and I changed my mind about moving. He said, I, I, finally, I feel a sense of connection back to the city. That's the answer to gentrification. Uh, really? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you know, if I go back, I think the first time I met you, um, who uh, my friend Miriam Nathan introduced me to. Mm. And I, I, I mentioned Miriam because when I first saw your name, I began to associate you with the Peace Cafe. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, talk about the creation of that. The Peace Cafe was formed about six years ago with a, um, a wonderful friend, Ari Roth, who is the artistic director of, Theater the, of Theater J, which is the Jewish theater here in Washington. And there was a play called Via Dolorosa that was being uh, performed at Theater J. And it's about the about a, um, a a story that was told by David Hare, who is the author, who traveled to Israel, mm -hmm. and decided to go into the Palestinian territory, and saw the imbalance between the two sides, and decided to come back and write a play about it, beautifully written play and very nuanced and uh, really uh, allowed people to see both sides of the conflict, mm -hmm. and being shown at a a Jewish theater in a, a a fairly conservative Jewish community center was, was, was sort of groundbreaking uh, in, a, in a sense. And so Ari approached me uh, and said to me, he said, um, you know, I think 
people are going to come into this play and see it and may get the wrong idea or may, you know, feel uncomfortable with it or something. Is there a way we can capture some of the energy, some of the interaction that people may want to have afterwards? Maybe create a comfortable space for them to come and sit down and talk to one another. And that's where the Peace Cafe was formed. We decided that if we're going to hold people after a showing of a theater, we have to provide food for them because mm -hmm. people are usually hungry. And when they're hungry, they're pissed. So we wanted to make sure that they, were, they had a you know, happy stomach. Mm -hmm. And we wanted to sit them in a place that's comfortable. And we wanted to sit them sort of together with people they didn't come with. And so we, it slowly oh. grew to become this wonderful venue. If you look at in this community, how are the relationships between you know, the Arab, Arab American community and the, Israel, the Israeli or Jewish community? How is, how is that here? Here in Washington? Yeah. Uh, you know, I can't say it's very good. It's, it's really not. I mean, I, I remember speaking at a synagogue a few years ago uh, out in Springfield, uh, Virginia. And uh, it was about a thousand people at, at the huge synagogue. And um, I remember all of them came up to me and said, this is the first time they've ever met an Arab. Mm -hmm. I'm shocked, you know, in a, in a, in a city that has such a, a diverse population, so many Arabs that live here, so many Jews that live here, for them not to interact with one another is very telling. Mm -hmm. um, the Peace Cafe allows people to just come together. You know, that's the first step for, mm -hmm. for bringing about peace, is you have to people look eye to eye at each other. Mm -hmm. And so, um, it, you know, it's, it, was, it was surprising to me, but yet it sort of told me that we need to do more of this type of thing. And so we've been doing the Peace Cafe now for seven years. And what do you uh, think has been the impact? Uh, what, what impact has it had? Um, well, I mean, whatever impact has happened, it, it, it's, it's very individual. It's, it's not a collective impact. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that's the important thing to understand about, about the Peace Cafe. I tell people when they come to Peace Cafe, you're not going to solve the Arab-Israeli problem. <laughs> you're not going to get peace in the Middle East with this, with this encounter. This is about personal transformation. If you take it as such, you will get a lot out of it. If you don't, you'll be very disappointed, probably more upset than you walked in. Yeah. So immediately I set the standards right from the beginning yeah. when people walk into a Peace Cafe and tell them what this is about. So this is really about personal contacts. Now, out of the Peace Cafe, a lot of stuff has, has, has come out. There's been lobbying groups that have been formed. There has been uh, a lot of social type groups, um, lots of interactions with, with different people that still see each other and become very close friends, Arabs and Jews. Mm -hmm. And those things make a difference. Over time, those things do make a difference. Let's look at some of the things I asked you in terms of the beginning of the show that you commented on. And keep in mind your last remark. So we look at, say, the conflict in terms of 67. We look at, say, recent Israel's in, involvement in Lebanon. Don't those type of events pull people apart in terms of, you know, we could be meeting and then mm -hmm. all of a sudden, you know, a war breaks out? Well, whenever something like this happens, like the war breaking out, I get so many emails saying, we have to have a peace cafe today. Please announce a peace cafe. One, do a peace cafe. The minute any sort of major catastrophe or an incident happens, people are clamoring to come together to talk. So the Peace Cafe has, has sort of created the infrastructure for that. Uh, so whenever there is a, a serious issue, like for example, the Lebanon war that just happened, we immediately, the week after, we had a huge Peace Cafe. And the most amazing stuff happens at those things. There was a woman there who was an Israeli, a, an, an Israeli Jew, been living here, she's, she's American also, and she said, you know, uh, she's a, a wonderful lady who named Judith, said, you know, I, I really am I'm concerned about my brother who, 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 who lives in this kibbutz, which is about maybe like 20 miles south of the border of Lebanon. He said, I'm really concerned about him. He's one of the few still there. He's kind of minding the store, so to speak. And she says, you know, I, I, I talk to him every day and he's, he's really worried about the rockets that have been, uh, you, know, uh, you know, lobbed into Israel from the Hezbollah. And uh, you know, then there's this, this Lebanese and Palestinian guy saying, what are you talking about? You know, there's been so many attacks against our people and you know, you're worried about your brother's thing? You know, give me a break, you know, that kind of thing. The next week, we were reading the paper, her, her brother got killed by one of those rockets. And we all come back together to mourn his death. Amazingly moving experience and really sort of brings to life the reality of, of war. There is no winners, there is no losers. Mm -hmm. Everybody loses, you know, everybody loses. Let's talk about uh, winning and losing. We know, for example, that um, after 9-11, um, 
our relationship for with Arab Americans change. I mean, in terms of if you're sitting on an airplane, all of a sudden you look and see if the person next to you is Arab American. Uh -huh. uh, where were you on the day of 9-11? I was actually taking a class um, on, on 17th Street at the National Restaurant Association. It was my health health inspection class. I had to take a class there. And the, and the class was dismissed halfway through because of the attacks. And I remember walking out sort of in, in a daze. Everybody was just of running around trying to get on their cell phones talking. And I immediately headed to my restaurants. And uh, they were packed, packed with people. You know, everybody's like waiting for news. We had, the, we had the radio on, we had television on. People were trying to, you know, connect with loved ones. We were trying to help them, you know, make phone calls and things like that. So that's where I was on 9-11. And then, you know, I was, I was uh, as the day wore off and you started understanding this is going to be a huge problem because they've, they've discovered that many of the attackers were actually of Arab descent, you know, my heart fell. I, I knew there was going to be trouble. Let me ask you about yeah. that because our mutual friends do hear Hamar writes about this. Yeah. Um, did you, Annie, so, uh, experience any sort of hate mail or phone calls? While Nothing overtly. Uh, very interesting. I mean, very minor stuff. The, but the the other stuff is the stuff that you, you know, you know and, and it's interesting because I talk to my black friends mm -hmm. and they feel it. You know, it's the same kind of stuff that happens. You know, it's not overt, mm -hmm. but yet it's under the surface, just enough. Um, you know, everyone put up flags uh, on the day after 9-11. After I thought, what is that? A flag is just a, a way to divide people. Mm -hmm. I don't want to put up a flag. You know, I'm part of the world. I'm part of humanity. Um, so I didn't put a flag. And I remember one of our neighbors walking by and saying, do you, do you need a flag? Do you, are you, I, you know, you don't have a flag? What's, and I said, no, thank you. She ended up having to bring a small flag and stick it in our, in our front yard. Um, Let's talk about you for a second, though, as a father. Um, you know the society's changing. Are you concerned about your daughter's safety? Are you concerned about what might happen to them in schools? I mean, do you discuss things in the house? You mean for them being Arab? Yeah. Um, and, and after 9-11? I mean. we, we talk about it all the time. I mean, and, and I, I am one that I've always taught my, my children that they have to, to, to stand up for, for justice. They have to stand up for what they believe in. If they see injustice being done, if they don't do something about it, they're part of it. They're part of the injustice, no matter who it is, you know. Let's look at something, make a parallel here. Uh -huh. When we look at what you tell your daughters, mm -hmm. you know, it's this time. Is your father saying the same thing to you? Is, is it easier to raise, was it easier to raise a child back in like the 60s as it is today as an American in um, the society? We learned most Taking of Taking into our consideration 9-11. Yeah, I, I, you know, we learned most of our stuff with, when it comes to my parents through osmosis. I mean, I, I, <laughs> there wasn't a lot of like sit down, okay, this is how it's yeah. done, this is how we do it. I, I don't remember many of those types of conversations with my parents. It was all, you know, the Middle East is very communal anyway, you know, so you learn from the community. You know, there's so many, there's so many, um, you know, checkpoints mm -hmm. throughout your life and your interactions on a daily basis that you don't stray very far, mm -hmm. you know, so everything's kind of set for you. Uh, in this kind of culture where there's really very few checkpoints and you're kind of wide open, everything is wide open, it's easy to stray. So if you don't sit down with your kids and talk to them about these issues, mm -hmm. They can go in any, do any well, direction. Let's, let's talk about the checkpoints. Um, after 9-11, we saw um, our government uh, making changes in some of the laws. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, we know, for example, when we look at civil liberties, uh, many Arab Americans you know, were concerned uh, about how they were treated, mm -hmm. you know, how they might have been um, harassed. Mm -hmm. uh, do you know in terms of, of how this affected maybe some of your friends? Oh, yeah. I mean, many. Uh, there, even even my brother had the FBI visit him. I mean, there there has been a lot of a lot of people we knew that ended up, uh, you know, either being deported or being harassed or being uh, somewhere detained, um, and for for no reason other than the fact they were Arab. Uh, many people were were kept off planes uh, without an apology, um, as if this was the norm. And uh, how dare us even ask, you know, 
um, what would you do? Why would you know? Why would you expect otherwise? You know, this became a different country, a whole you, different country. You ever look at yourself as a as an average American businessman and perhaps look back to Japanese businessmen in say California? Oh. oh, no question, no question. I mean, that the first thing that came to our minds is internment, and it's still not off the table. I mean, that's the scary part of that was what we're going through, is you know we've been very lucky that we haven't had another huge attack or huge incident, but you know it's only a matter of time. Do you, uh, do you feel that this is something that's not discussed like openly, you know, where you pick up the newspaper and it's an op-ed piece or there's somebody running for political office and they mention this? Um, it, it's, I, think, I think we tend to be in denial about these things and we tend to react rather than act. Um, so I think, you know, a, again, I mean, Arab, the Arab American community here has tried to make some strides to try to move forward on some legislation and so on. but it's very difficult to move in any direction at this point with this current administration. Um, but again, everybody's waiting for the other shoe to drop. You know, we're sort of just limping through right now. Um, I think, you know, the one thing that 9-11 taught me is that, is, is that no matter how much stride you make in this country, you're always a guest. You're always going to be the guest. You're never going to feel like you really belong here. Let me ask you this, when you talk about belonging, uh, many times, especially for people who are, who are not Arab American, when we think about Arabs, we, we, we immediately think that they're all Muslims, which is not right. the case. We go over the, how does religion, uh, what roles does religion play in your, in your life? Um, not much. Uh, I, I'm not a religious person. I, um, I'm, a, I'm a spiritual person, but I, I don't, uh, I'm not a religious person. Um, I grew up in a family that was pretty secular. You know, my, my parents, uh, you know, celebrated the holidays just because it was fun. Uh, it, it wasn't because they were, there because of the religious implications. Uh, you know, Ramadan was big in our family because it was just a great time for a family to come together. You know, we'd fast all day and, you know, get together at night and, you know, everybody brings something. So how, how do you feel when, when you look at how society, societies have changed, you know, not only here but in many other countries? where you see Islam having a presence to such an extent that when people talk about Arabs, they just think immediately of Islam. Does that sort of mess with your own identity in terms of, you know? Well, I, I do identify as a Muslim, mm -hmm. so it, it's, it's, not, it's not that. I, I do feel that there's a lot of ignorance in, in this country still. Uh, you know, there has been a lot of opportunities to learn, and, uh, and yet we tend to always revert to the lowest common denominator when something like 9-11 happens. Mm -hmm. And, and, and again, I think the true test would be what are we going to be like as a society if, God forbid, another uh, you know, catastrophic incident happens like 9-11? Well, let's go back. I'm coming to the end of this interview, Andy, and um, I opened up asking you a question about your childhood, and I asked about whether there were certain memories that you cherish. Mm. I wonder how you feel when you look at television or read about the bombings and what's happening in Baghdad, what's happening in Iraq. Does it break those memories that perhaps that you've had of that? Well, you know, it's, 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 it's interesting. When the, um, when the whole issue about Iraq uh, and the attack on Iraq happened, I never felt so Iraqi in my life. You know, I remember sitting in front of the television set on March 19th, two days before my birthday, um, you know, watching the, sh the shock and awe bombing, and I, and I wept. I, I just cried openly. Um, it's a, there, are, there are moments that I find um, that really make me um, sort of question about what are the true values that this country stands for. Are these the values that my parents certainly decide to stay here for? Um, you know, these are really very, very difficult times. And, uh, you know, seeing the, 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 the carnage and the, and the amount of destruction that we're creating all over the world in the name of America and identifying as an American right now it really makes me want to just get up and, 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 and do something about it and, and constantly speak about it so that I could let the rest of the world know that Americans aren't those people that are destroying all over the world, but really people who care about justice, who care about you know, humanity and so on. And I don't think that message is out there enough. And uh, I feel like it's my duty, uh, because I am, I've assumed the identity of an American, that I have to prove to the world that being an American is a great thing. And, you know, having a situation that happens like happening in, in, in Iraq and all the, 
the death and destruction sort of forces me in the, in the limelight to continue to speak about justice and, and, and the values that this country stands for. Well, Andy, I'm certain people look at this interview and say, well, you're a great man. Thank oh, you thank you so much. much. <laughs> thank you.